Hi, I'm David Noble. Welcome to the channel. Um, no episode last week because I was busy editing for the Ferrari Race Days video that I recorded. Um, so this is episode two, a racing fan talks motorsport. Not the best title in the world, but you know, I wanted to record something. I'm running with it for now. Um, so that said, roll the intro. Now, with two weeks gone by, obviously that leaves us quite a bit to talk about. Um, you had the Grand Prix, which is obviously all content creators in the world went, yay, we have a race. And, oh no, it's Sochi. And then what do you know? Sochi turned out to actually be good, which is like one of the shocks of the season. Um, <laughs> it all started, of course, because of the weather, which threw a lot of spanners in the air. Um, you know, missing sessions, uh, qualifying being mixed, the race, yeah, so that was a uh, fun, um, qualifying itself, of course, who, who, who saw that happening, um, you had so many drivers that were sort of starting out of position because of engine penalties, they were sort of like, felt like a lot of people on the grid were not really committed to it as such. Um, you had the Mercedes fastest cars for the whole thing and then they made the wrong call in Q3 and ended up scuppering themselves so they went from being like clear favourites to 4th and 7th which then turned into a lot later than that for Bottas as he had to change engine things yeah, and he clearly didn't think a lot of that either I'm guessing from his race day performance but uh, there you go. I mean, shall we get into that? Let's talk race. You know, um, Lewis qualifying fourth needed a good start. Didn't get one. Got boxed in, got held up, got held back. So you had Sainz and Norris fighting for the lead at the front. You know, either of them's a interesting result. You know, we'd, I think we'd have been quite happy either way for that one. Um, Norris getting the advantage in the end and leading the majority of the race. Uh, he is my driver of the weekend, probably fairer to say. And yeah, I know the wet weather screwed him, or <laughs> screwed is the wrong word, but it ruined his it ruined his race a little bit, and that was the game changer for everything. Um, people who hadn't really been where they wanted to be in the race up to that point the weather changing gave them like another chance or another roll of the dice to make something of it and those who gambled early on this intermediates were the ones who came out well from it so you had max for example it sort of stalled out a bit in about seventh place because he just the medium tires he hadn't managed to get to work properly being stuck in like drs train and stuff and you know having to manage them just couldn't get them into the window he wanted them so he'd got stuck and the change in the weather gave him the chance to jump up to second you know fair play it was still a great performance and you have to play the weather and everything you have during a race to you know maximize your weekend and he, you know him and Red Bull they did that so from 20th to second is like the ultimate damage limitation almost um Lewis Congratulations to him on his 100th win. I'm not convinced that was necessarily the race he'd been the most proud of in terms of trying to achieve that, but yeah, again, it's because of qualifying he wasn't in the position he wanted to be. Because of that, he didn't possibly get the run in that he would have wished for going into turn one, which then put him further back in the pack. And with that straight DRS, the McLarens being straight line weapons, let's be honest with you, it just couldn't do a lot about Daniel Ricciardo, but then they played the strategy card well, they looked after the tyres, went longer, um, and then managed to get Daniel Ricciardo, put Lewis into clean air, and then from there he could play catch up, and the hunting down of Lando and the 
counter fastest laps from Lando. That was that was great, and it looked set up nicely. Um, but I think Lando would have had it. Uh, this is my reason for kind of. You don't expect the McLaren at the moment to be on pace fighting for race wins against the Mercedes. But they've been managing it the last couple of races and that's... You know, track position is king, but they've got qualifying right. You know, they've put themselves in a position where they can compete and absolute fair play to them. Um, what done for it though with Lando was... I mean, it's easy for us sitting on an armchair at home going, well, why didn't you do that? Uh, but let's put it from perspective. Lando Norris leading the race, his first possible race win in touching distance, you know, three, four laps in the future. So close to it, so nearly there. You know, um, when the team sort of suggested to him about coming into pit, you know, as Charles Leclerc said himself, because he suffered the same fate, you know, in two sectors you were slightly slower, but in the third one, at that point, the softs still had grip, so you weren't losing that much time over a lap. So the drivers themselves, you know, Lewis hadn't wanted to pit, several of the drivers hadn't wanted to pit. Um, and McLaren are hungry now. You know, ever since, ever since sort of Spa, when they saw that Lando, how quick he was in qualifying, yes, it went wrong because he ended up in a wall, but they had the pace. And then you get to Monza. And, you know, Daniel Ricciardo wins and Lando in second place. And McLaren now are hungry and you can see it. And it's sort of like, you know, when Lewis pitted, it was sort of like Lando and the team were almost like, OK, but if we pit now, we're going to come out in second and the race is going to be lost either way. And from their point of view, it's like if the heavier rain had held off for another five minutes or if it had missed the circuit by like half a mile, you know, Lando was then winning that race. That was his race at that point. So they hedged their bets and they hoped. And I can kind of understand that. And I think from a McLaren point of view, the fact that they're willing to try and look at that and look at, you know, taking the race wins that's amazingly strong for them when you think from where they've come so well it isn't the result they would have wished for you know it's f absolute fair play to them you know i can't i can't knock them for the ambition um but you know looking at some of the other people in the row obviously what then happened to lando finishing seventh the results don't tell the race let's be honest um as I said, the guys who pitted for the Inters, they're kind of the winners from it, literally in the case of Lewis. But, you know, a win is a win. In this case, it's 100. So you know, I think he's going to more than take that. You know, he had to put himself in that position in the first place. Him and the team, the team made the right call. Lewis eventually agreed with them. So, you know, they did what they needed to do. Uh, running in second place, Basically, he had nothing to lose from pitting. He was running in second place. If he took the pit stop, he was still going to be in second place. So, even if it hadn't properly bucketed it down, there was not a loss that they could take from that, really. Um, you know, Max, as I said, jammed up in seventh, finished second. Fair result for him. But Valtteri Bottas, like running practically 14th the whole race, not putting any dent anywhere at all. You know, it's basically might as well not have been there. I mean, it's just like the guy who's utterly fed up was the way it felt from trying to, like, why is he there? Um, and then finishes fifth because the team put him on the right tyres at the right time. That's all it comes down to, which is kind of crazy. You know, um, beyond that, obviously, you had good performances from Sainz and Daniel Ricciardo, who managed to st score strong points for their teams. So, I mean, the race was, up until four laps left, it was a good race, and then it became a lottery. 
Uh, I don't particularly like lotteries, but you know, it's that edge of your seat, not knowing what's going to happen, kind of thing. It was very interesting. You know, very exciting. You know, we we enjoy races. We enjoy you know when it's not predictable. And Formula One definitely wasn't that. <laughs> Uh, what is it leaving with the title? I've said it suggested that, you know, at this point, having just come off some power circuits, which might suit McLar uh, McLaren, <laughs> Mercedes more than it might suit Red Bull for Max to only be two points behind Lois at this point, he'd have probably have taken. And yeah, you can see that. I mean, especially as he's got a new power unit as well. Yeah, he, he, he can't feel too bad about how it's shaken out. There's several other championships and whatever else going on. Um, the biggest one of which is probably IndyCar, which, since the last time I recorded one of these, had two different races. It had Laguna Seca, Herta dominating, Polo running in second, but it's like his race was never really with Herta. He was quite, you know, he was racing O'Ward. As so long as O'Ward was behind him, he was, Polo was basically just getting the car home at this point. You know, such was the lead he's kind of had it, or basically just seeing the title challenge out. You know, not not putting himself in any positions where he might compromise himself. It's a kind of very mature attitude to take towards it. But if you look at some of the drivers he's got around him who've, you know, fought strongly for championships and have been, you know, great racers and very experienced people. You know, there's a lot of people he can look towards and learn from, which, whether it's just he's done that or whether it's just like his natural awareness of stuff, I don't know. But, you know, um, Romain Grosjean and the corkscrew especially made it very, very fun to watch. Um, and Laguna was, was a very, very good race. So, I mean, IndyCar in general is pretty top-notch at the moment. It's been a very good season. Um... It seems to be a series that's very much on its way up, which is a very good thing. And then we get to Long Beach. Now at this point, after Laguna, we're down to a free car shootout for the championship. Plo's kind of got it sealed up, but not entirely. Awards in second place, still Pato's still in second place with a good shout. And Joseph Newgarden still touching distance. You know, if he wins and it goes wrong for the others, he could still win it and he did everything he could do to try and make that happen by qualifying on pole for the first race so qualifying on pole for the race um and it didn't quite go so well for the others down in like tenth and, but lower down in the pack which is where the problem happened you know because at the start of it you know new garden got away well yeah, Pato running got kept by Jones. Um, Polo was very Alex Polo was very lucky not to get caught up in that, because or we'll get serious damage in that, because his car did take a knock. But Ward unfortunately was basically out of the race at this point, which took the title challenges down to two. And as so long as Polo kept the car running, it was basically his, and the deal was kind of sealed more or less by. Uh, New Garden losing the lead again to Herter, and it's sort of like if Colton Herter had managed to have such a strong season altogether, he would almost certainly have been in that mix because it's like on his day he was like the guy to beat. But Plow just Plow just consistency again and again and again. And I say, I mean. Not very many people go into Ganassi and beat Scott Dixon. So that's just as a measure there of how good his season has been. So, you know, <laughs> awesome. Excellent work by him. And he had some lots of pictures over the week of him eating some well-deserved chicken with his trophy. So, <laughs> excellent stuff. Right. Um... Yeah, also he's apparently the first Spanish IndyCar champion, which I didn't really know about until recently, but congratulations to him. 
you know, people winning championships and stuff because it was also the finale of the uh, FIA F3 championship. And you had race one being held on the Friday because it was originally supposed to be in Kota that they were going to have the finale because obviously this year they'd separated the F2 and the F3. Uh, but instead, because how unsettled things were in America or whatever and costs of freight and various other things, they decided to move the finale of F3 to Sochi, um, which meant because the F2 was there as well, having to shift around programs or what have you. So the first race for F3 happened on, happened on the Friday. So you had Logan Sargent getting off to a good start, Victor Martins in second, fighting it out with Dennis Hauger. And obviously Hauger's basically fighting for his championship. Um, so it's like, how hard is he going to commit? Is he just going to hold station? No, he was properly fighting for second. Uh, it was a good race between all three of them, to be honest with you. Um, enjoyable battles going on there. And it was enough for Hauger to take the title. Which was probably a good thing, because on the Saturday, when it was supposed to be their race two, obviously their race two and the F2 race one both got cancelled because of the weather. So you're sort of stuck in the situation where, you know, had it have not been settled on the Friday race, the, ra the championship could have been decided by a cancelled race, which I don't think anyone would have been happy with. So it shaking out how it did was a good thing and then we had the race three on the sunday you know what i mean um then you had what was basically the battle for the team's championship and you had trident who was trying to catch up and with prima um there were not too many points behind and you had trident drivers first and second starting on the grid which you know any team who beats Prima in an F3 championship. I mean, that, to put it in perspective, I don't think that's happened in about 10 years. I mean, I know an FIA F3 Lando Norris driving for Carlin um, won the t driver's championship, but Prima won the team's championship that year. So it's just not something that really happens at that level. You know, it's like if you want to win an F3, you drive for Prima. That's how it goes. But, say, Jack Dillon was leading the race. Uh, rather controversially, the team basically asked him to move over and let Clement Novelak pass. Um, because, as I said, they were fighting for the team's championship. Clement Novelak basically felt almost like he needed a result he needed to win to kind of back up his third place in the championship because the difference between third and fourth place is something like 10 super license points which is obviously a big deal racing at that level you know it's significant um one of the people he was racing against for that was frederick vesti who was coming up close behind him Obviously, if he got tangled while he was trying to overtake Dewan, who he felt he was faster than, the team would lose out, he would lose out. You know, Frederick Vesti got past him or was fighting him and allowed other people to catch up and they got past him or whatever as well. We could lose in third place and them 10 points. So you can understand why, you know, he wasn't wanting to back off and give Dewan space and protect the 1-2 for the team. You know, as far as Dewan was concerned, he was paying his money to be there. He wanted to do his best. He wanted to take the win if it was available to him. So it put a Trident in a difficult place. And there is an argument that teams looking at that are going to be a bit like, well, Mick isn't a team player. But in the junior categories at that level, it's like they are kind of fighting for themselves. The team are just basically giving them a car to try and achieve their dream. They're not necessarily thinking about, the, you know, they're not paying like £800,000 a year or something to like focus on what the team is doing. You know, they want to help the team achieve brilliance by doing brilliantly themselves, you know. So I absolutely get why Jack Dewan didn't, but 
it's like the attitude of the team afterwards it became such a sort of thing and it's like guys you won just you know you won be happy with it <laughs> but you you wouldn't think that you from the way that they were acting you would think that they only just cost them the championship or something it's like no but so yeah um on a personal note uh a guy we've been supporting for ages well since i age since 2017 so um Ethan Simmons got his first run out in F3. Um, he hadn't sat in the car at all before the Friday. He hadn't done any testing or anything in it. He hadn't done any simulator running or anything in it. So, and he had never raced at Sochi before. So, talk about you know jumping straight out of the frying pan into the fire. And as you can imagine, Quali didn't quite go to plan. Uh, ended up further back but in the races kept progressing forward um, and then to add insult to injury the second race got cancelled so he didn't get to race in that and then the third race he ended up having to start from the pit lane so proper baptism of fire for that series but he did as well as I think you could possibly expect him to do so fair play to him well done Edson in the F2 as well, obviously you had another race being cancelled there. Um, the first race, uh, reverse grid race, so that would have been race one that was delayed and race two that was cancelled. Yeah. You kind of lose track eventually. Um, Dan Tictum got away well, even from Gary Vips, uh, Liam Lawson originally, and then you had... Robert Schwartzman finishing third place at the end after Lawson got involved in an incident. Um, disaster for Uni Virtuosi going to the grid with Zhao, who is obviously the championship contending driver. You know, in second place, Oscar Piastri uh, just spun it and then couldn't get going and didn't get started. Um, his teammate, Felipe Drogovic, weird accident. The back end just spun him into the wall. Um, and it was bad enough that the doctors didn't consider him fit to race the next day so obviously we wish him well and hope he's i mean he should be back considering there isn't another race for about two months or something stupid the f2 calendar is a real mess this year um so yeah but piastri starting about 12 with the cars close together drs trains and stuff couldn't really f and the track being wet, wet offline just couldn't get his way through the pack to get into the points himself so although it wasn't great Zhao went out the piastri wasn't able to capitalize but you know at the same time he didn't lose anything so you know ticked him on the race um, Vips was second, it kind of put them back in, and Schwarzman third, kind of put them back a little bit more into the championship mix. You know, they're respectively within sight of them. Um, on the race two, the feature race on the Sunday, you know, Piastri qualified on pole. It's now like three poles in a row. He's looking like the proper, he's definitely being the guy to beat this year. You know, he came into the championship. As F3 champion, we thought, you know, this year he was going to run Schwartzman close maybe, but Robert would probably have it as having more experience at this level. It hasn't happened that way. Um, you know, Piestri's just picked up where he left off of F3. And he's doing a really, really good job. So, yeah. He's not running away with it. He can still be beaten, but he's... It's not pre-season. This wasn't necessarily where we expected him to be. So, what can you do? He's done all right for himself. Um, but he led away from pole. Um, poor chair tried to run a lap longer to overcut him because F2 don't have tyre warmers. So when they come out of the pits, it takes them a while to warm the car up, tyres up to get grip, so that their first lap out isn't tend to be very fast. So if you can go a lap longer, you might get track position, which is what happened. But then, of course, the problem was Piastri had heat in his tyres, whereas Porchette didn't, so he just went past them anyway. But from there, it was like the two of them, 
not really giving each other any space, you know, racing each other. PS, poor chair staying close enough so that Piastri had an issue, he could capitalise on it, but not perhaps getting close enough to really threaten an overtake. And that continues for there. And I mean, those two out of the rookies that come in this year, and there's a really good batch of rookies, but you know, poor chair is definitely talked about as future F1 star and Piastri. Nobody can really understand why he isn't other than money because PS3 doesn't come from, isn't minted, you know, he's not like Zhao with the whole nation's backing behind him. Um, so it's a pain for him, but, uh, you know, winning the F2 title in your rookie year, that's a pretty solid result. And I know PS3's came out in the news recently and said that if he has to sit on the sidelines next year, you know, he's willing to do that if he can get himself into a, the window for the following year. And, you know, a reserve seat at, at Renault, while he, Renault? Alpine, while he does something else, it could be worse. You know, he's got, he keeps himself in the window on the, you know, people aware of him, he's got a shot. But just this year, the spaces aren't really there, unfortunately. So, let's see how that goes. Only really Frecker left. The Formula Regional European Championship by Alpine. Uh, it's like, why didn't we have it like it is now from the start? Because you've got Franco Colapinto has suddenly basically come alive. You know, qualified on pole for the first race. Um, him leading away from David Vidalez, who again, it's like started the season winning the first race and then has just disappeared off the planet. And it's just like, why, where have you been? Um, but Franco Colapinto, he's had a lot of bad luck with reliability. He's missed a lot of races because of other commitments, because he's been in sports car racing and stuff, um, for budgetary reasons, unfortunately, as much as anything else. Because I get the impression he's not, like got enough money necessarily to see himself getting higher up the ladder so he's been investigating other stuff and he's been doing decently in other stuff you know people wax lyrically about Franco Colapinto and how fast he is in sports cars you know so it's like whatever happens he's got a really good career going on but he's absolutely come alive the past couple of weekends in Frecker which is he's the you know fantastic we've got someone else like challenging for wins and you know strong podium results to try and make sure Gregor Saucy just doesn't totally walk it but he's the wrong guy you know Hedrin David or Zane Maloney or someone doing it and they're like running around in sixth seventh eighth so even on a weekend where like in the first race Gregor Saucy was out of the points and like his title rivals could have actually punished him. They just weren't at the sharp end. And, you know, if someone with a 70 odd point lead in the championship doesn't score points, you need to be the guy that's winning. And Franco Colapinto was winning. And he won the first race and finished second in the second race. Um, so it's outstanding for him and it's great for him and, you know, absolutely brilliant. That it needed to be someone else from a championship perspective. Um, you know, Gregor Saucy in the second race was pushing him in third place. Again, another podium. Again, neither of his cham main championship rivals anywhere near him. So even on a weekend when he doesn't win, he's still gaining points on other people. So it, it it's his... I can't, you know, he's got something like a, he could not turn up for the next round and still come out of it in the lead, even if someone else won both races, which is a bit ridiculous. But he's, he's the guy nobody saw coming. No one was expecting or talking about Gregor Saucy coming into this year. You know, we were saying, you know, like his teammates could learn from his experience, maybe. But nobody had him pegged as a championship winner. But he's gone and done it. He's doing it very much. Um, Mikhail Balov in the second race. Again, rookie, been very inconsistent this year. He's had his moments, but this was it. You know, he got his pole position. He defended well from Renko Palapinto. 
uh, when the safety car came out, he managed that well, managed to get ahead of, stay ahead of Franco Colapinto then. Um, it's a great result for him. Which nearly takes us to the end. Uh, I don't have a lot left to say about the racing currently beyond. Um, I would like to say after the disappointment of Le Mans, uh, of the WRT team, specifically their European Le Mans series outfit, um, it's great to see them actually wrap up the European Le Mans series title. So, you know, congratulations to WRT and Lou Delatraz and Robert Kibitza and Yefe. Yefe, yay. One day I'll learn which way around it's supposed to be said. Um, so congratulations to them. Um, and I rambled and chatted and rushed my way through this or whatever, and there's a million things I probably should have talked about or could have put better. Um, and I haven't done, just because while I've made a few notes and bits and pieces, I haven't scripted this. So there's always the fear that it doesn't come out quite as well as it should do. At the end of the day, I'm not a journalist. I'm not someone in the industry. I am just a racing fan. You know, other people are going to have their opinions. Other people are completely entitled to their opinions. Um, um, you're welcome to share them with me. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye for now.